The battles of Narvik were fought from 9 April to 8 June 1940 as a naval battle in the Ofot Fjord, and as a land battle in the mountains surrounding the north Norwegian town of Narvik as part of the Norwegian campaign of the Second World War. The two naval battles in the Ofot Fjord on 10 April and 13 April were fought between the British Royal Navy and Nazi Germany's Kriegsmarine, while the two-month land campaign was fought between Norwegian, French, British, and Polish troops against German mountain troops, shipwrecked Kriegsmarine sailors and German paratroopers from the 7th Air Division. Although defeated at sea off Narvik, losing control of the town of Narvik and being pushed back towards the Swedish border, the Germans eventually prevailed because of the Allied evacuation from Norway in June 1940 following the Battle of France. Narvik provided an ice-free harbour in the North Atlantic for iron ore transported by the railway from Kiruna in Sweden. Both sides in the war had an interest in securing this iron supply for themselves and denying it to the enemy, setting the stage for one of the biggest battles, since the invasion of Poland. Prior to the German invasion, British forces had considered Narvik as a possible landing point for an expedition to help Finland in the Winter War. Such an expedition also had the potential of taking control of the Swedish mines and opening up the Baltic for the Allies. French politicians were also eager to start a second front as far away from France as possible. Chapter 1 – German Invasion On 1 March 1940, Adolf Hitler ordered the invasion of Norway, codenamed Operation Weziubung as a preventive maneuver against a planned, and openly discussed, Franco-British occupation of Norway. This operation would involve most of the Kriegsmarine. Participating units were divided into five groups, which were to occupy six of the main Norwegian ports. Group I departed Bremerhaven on 6 April. It consisted of ten German destroyers of the 1934A and 1936 classes Georg Thiele, Wolfgang Zenker, Bernd von Arnim, Erik Gieser, Erik Koelner, Dieter von Rode, Hans Ludemann, Hermann Kuhner, Wilhelm Heidkamp, and Anton Schmidt, commanded by Commodore Friedrich Bonte. Each of the warships carried around 200 soldiers from the 139th Mountain Regiment of the 3rd Mountain Division commanded by General Eduard Dietl. The troop-carrying destroyers were escorted most of the way by the battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. In the early morning of 9 April, the destroyers of Group I passed the Vestfjorden and arrived at the Ofotfjorden leading to Narvik, in fog and heavy snow. In Ofotfjord, they captured three Norwegian patrol boats. Before capture Kelt managed to send a message to the coastal defence ship Hnums Norge, alerting the local Norwegian naval commander of the incoming vessels. The German ships Wolfgang Zenker, Erik Koelner and Hermann Kuhner landed their soldiers in Harjangsfjord in order to capture a Norwegian regimental supply base at Elgardsman. Hans Ludemann and Hermann Kuhner also landed their troops in order to engage the nearby Norwegian forts. Dieter von Roder remained in Ofotfjord in order to ensure German control of the sea. Erik Gieser was delayed by engine trouble and did not join the main force for some time. The main defence of Narvik were the old coastal defence ships Eidsvold and Norge. Having been alerted by Kelt, both Norwegian ships prepared for combat, the guns were loaded and life preservers issued to the crew. Around 4.15, the Germans spotted Eidsvold, and Eidsvold immediately signalled the leading German destroyer with an Aldis lamp. When the Germans failed to respond to the signal, a warning shot was fired across their bow. The Germans had orders to occupy Norway peacefully if at all possible, so the German flagship Wilhelm Heidkamp stopped and signalled that it would send an officer to negotiate. A small launch ferried Corvette in Capitan Gerlach over to Eidsvold. Gerlach was taken to the bridge to speak to Captain Odd Isaacson Willock. Gerlach tried to convince Willock that the Germans had arrived as friends but that the Norwegians had to hand over their warships to the German armed forces. Captain Willock asked for time to consult his commander, Captain Per Askeem, the commander of Norge. This request was refused by the Germans, but while Willock had been talking to the German officer the radio officer on board Eidsvold had communicated the events to Askeem. 
Askim's response to the German demands and order to Willock came immediately, Willock and Eidsvold was to open fire. Willock responded to Askim, I am attacking. While this was going on, the German destroyer Wilhelm Heidkamp, had positioned herself 700 meters off the port side of Eidsvold and trained her torpedo launchers on the Norwegian ship. Gerlach tried once again to convince Willock to surrender, but Willock refused. As Gerlach left Eidsvold, he fired a red flare, indicating that the Norwegians intended to fight. At this point, Captain Willock shouted, Par plas ved kanonin. Na skel vi slas, gutter. Eidsold turned towards the closest destroyer and accelerated, closing the distance to Wilhelm Heidkamp to 300 meters while the battery commander ordered the port battery guns to open fire. The Germans, afraid that Eidsold might ram the destroyer, fired four torpedoes from Wilhelm Heidkamp at the, the old ship. Two of the torpedoes hit before the port guns could fire. The Norwegian ammunition magazine was ignited and Eidsold was blown in two. The forward part of the ship sank in seconds, the stern followed in minutes, propellers still turning. At around 4.37, she was gone. 175 Norwegian sailors died in the freezing water, including Captain Willock, with just eight surviving dot deeper inside the fjord, the explosions were heard aboard Norge, but nothing could be seen until two German destroyers suddenly appeared out of the darkness and Captain Per Askim of Norge gave orders to open fire at 4.45. Four rounds were fired from the 21cm guns as well as seven or eight rounds from the starboard 15cm guns, against the German destroyer Bernd von Arnim, at a range of about 800 meters. Due to the difficult weather conditions, the gun's optical sights were ineffective, the first salvo fell short of the target, and the next ones overshot it. The German destroyers waited until they were alongside the pier before returning fire. Bernd von Armin opened fire with her 12.7 cm guns as well as with machine guns, but the weather gave the Germans problems as well. The destroyer also fired three salvos of two torpedoes each. The first two salvos missed, but the last struck Norge midships and she sank in less than one minute. Ninety of the crew were rescued, but one hundred and one perished in the battle which had lasted less than twenty minutes. The destruction of Norge signalled the end of Norwegian resistance in the port. Much of the Norwegian garrison at Narvik awoke to the sound of gunfire and were unprepared to face the Germans. Many were surrounded and disarmed as they scrambled to occupy defensive positions. The commander-in-chief of the Narvik area, Colonel Conrad Sundlow, is often cited as the reason for the quick capitulation. Described by Kriegsmariner Admiral Eric Redder as an officer with reportedly pro-German feelings, he quickly withdrew from the area following the naval engagement and began negotiations with the Germans. After the initial loss of Narvik, Norwegian General Carl Gustav Fleischer sent out a communique, part of which read. Colonel Sundlow initiated immediate negotiations for a ceasefire and withdrew the troops to Framnes. The Germans occupied the city and the Norwegian troops were surrounded between the Germans and the sea. The division commander, who was in East Finnmark, was notified about the situation by telephone and he ordered Colonel Sundlow's second-in-command, Major Omdal, to arrest Colonel Sundlow. Sundlow was charged with treason for the surrender of Narvik after the war, but these charges were dismissed. Instead he was found guilty of negligence for failing to adequately prepare for Narvik's defense, and on charges for cooperating with the Germans during the occupation. The morning of the German attack four Norwegian steamers were anchored in Narvik, the 4285 GRT Cape B, the 1712 GRT Eldred, the 1758 GRT Harleg and the 4306 GRT Safir. In addition to the Norwegian vessels, four foreign, neutral ships were present, the 951 GRT Dutch steamer Bernus, and the three Swedish steamships Boden, Oxelosund and Strasse. As well as neutral ships, the warring parties had vessels at Narvik, riding anchor in the same port. The British had five steamers in the harbour, the 6582 GRT Blythemoor, 
the 5141 GRT Mersington Court, the 4304 GRT North Cornwall, the 5378 GRT Riverton, and the 4887 GRT Romanby. As the German flotilla seized Narvik, there were 11 German merchant steamers at the port town, the 6388 GRT Arken, the 5398 GRT Altona, the 4902 GRT Borkenheim, the 5386 GRT Heinheuer, the 4879 GRT Martha Henrich Fisser, the 8096 GRT Neuenfels, the 5806 GRT Odin, the 7849 GRT Lip, the 4339 GRT Frengers, the 5881 GRT Planet, and the 11776 GRT Replenishment Oiler-slash-Maintenance Ship Jan Wellim. Jan Wellim, a converted former whale factory ship, awaited the arrival of the German warships, which she was tasked to refuel. Working in the harbour, were the Swedish tugs Diana and Steyerbjorn. As the German destroyers entered the harbour, the captain of Borkenheim, who assumed that the intruding warships were British, beached and scuttled his vessel. In total, 25 or ships had been riding at anchor in Narvik at the outset of the fighting, 10 of which were German. The German destroyers were now short of fuel and had only one fuel tanker in support the ex whale factory ship Jan Wellim that had been dispatched to Narvik, accordingly to some sources from the secret German naval base basis Nord at Zapadnaya Litsa in the Soviet Union, where she had been based since 4 February 1940. Another source indicates that she departed Murmansk in the evening of 6 April and that basis Nord was never even established. She had arrived off Narvik from the north on 8 April, and had been stopped by the Norwegian patrol boat Kutoy. Jan Wellim was allowed entry to Narvik by the regional Norwegian Naval Command, where she was inspected. Her captain claimed that she was carrying 8,500 short tons of fuel oil and 8,098 crates of food provisions and that she was on her way to Germany. A second tanker, the 6,031 GRT Kattegat which had sailed to Norway from Wilhelmshaven, had been sunk in the Glomfjord in the evening of 9 April. Kattegat had been stopped by the Norwegian fishery protection ship Hunams Nord Cap, the Norwegian ship first trying to take the tanker as a prize, but due to the large German crew could not control it all the way to Bodo, in the end sinking Kattegat by firing four 47mm rounds into the tanker's water line. Kattegat, had been delayed from reaching Narvik in time by the British the 8th of April mining operations off Norway. A third tanker, Skeirog, had also been dispatched to Norway, in support of the German landings at Trondheim but she was intercepted by the British cruiser HMS Suffolk, on 14 April, after she had been redirected by German naval command to a waiting position at sea. When the British warship tried to board Skeirog her crew scuttled her at 68 degrees 15 no 2 degrees 00 e. Both Kattegat and Skeirog, which were sister ships, were inspected at Kopovic by the Norwegian torpedo boat Steg, on 5 and 7 April respectively. The captain of Kattegat told the Norwegians that he was headed to Narvik for further orders, and the captain of Skeirog claimed Murmansk as their destination, and inspections revealed that both tankers had a full load of fuel oil. Skeirog also carried 165 short tons of food provisions, which was claimed as supplies for German merchant ships. The food crates were labeled Wehrmacht. According to the German plan the destroyers were supposed to have been refueled by two tankers, Kattegat and Jan Wellim, each receiving some 600 short tons of fuel oil. The flotilla was then to be on its way back to Germany by the evening of 9 April. The plan failed because only Jan Wellim made it to Narvik. Refueling with just one tanker was difficult, only two destroyers could be refueled simultaneously, taking seven or eight hours. At arrival in Narvik, the destroyers were almost out of fuel. Making the refueling more challenging was the fact that Jan Wellim had only improvised refueling arrangements and inferior pumping equipment. While two destroyers were being refueled at a time, a third was on guard in fjord, 
the remaining seven being spread around in the nearby area. By four o'clock on the 10th of April, Jan Wellem had managed to fully refuel three of the German destroyers, and was in the process of refueling two more. In the meantime, British forces had tried to engage the Kriegsmariner, but for the most part, unsuccessfully. On the 8th of April, the British G class destroyer HMS Glowworm engaged the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper and two destroyers, and was lost, ramming and damaging Hipper in the battle. On the 9th of April morning, the British battlecruiser HMS Renown exchanged artillery salvos with the German battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, which were screening the destroyers. During the battle one of the artillery shells from Renown damaged fire control system on Gneisenau, the British battlecruiser was also hit two times and slightly damaged. After that the German battleships withdrew from the battle at high speed. The destroyer's main mission had been completed, however, as they had succeeded in landing the invasion force. Chapter 2, First Naval Battle of Narvik The day after the German invasion, the Royal Navy took an opportunity to defeat the Kriegsmariner. The second destroyer flotilla, under Commodore Bernard Warburton Lee and comprising five H-class destroyers, Hotspur, Havoc, Hunter and Hostile, moved up the fjord in the early morning. The German destroyers Hermann Kuhner and Hans Ludemann were anchored alongside the tanker Jan Wellim and refueling when the British destroyer attack began at 4.30. The German picket ship had left its post to refuel, and as the British flotilla approached Narvik, they surprised and engaged a German force at the entrance to the harbour and sank the two destroyers Wilhelm Heidkamp and Anton Schmidt, heavily damaged Dietha von Rode and inflicted lesser damage on two others. They also exchanged fire with German invasion troops ashore but did not have a landing force aboard and therefore turned to leave. Before the destroyers left the scene, Hostile fired her torpedoes at the merchant ships in the harbour. In total, 11 merchant ships were sunk during the British sortie into the harbour. The British flotilla was then engaged by three more German destroyers emerging from the Harjangsfjord, led by Commander Eric Bay and then two more coming from Ballingen Bay, under Commander Fritz Berger. In the ensuing battle, two British destroyers were lost, the flotilla leader HMS Hardy, which was beached in flames and HMS Hunter, which was torpedoed and sunk. A third, HMS Hotspur, was also damaged badly by a torpedo. Hotspur and the remaining British destroyers left the battlefield, damaging Georg Thiele as they did so. The German destroyers, now short of fuel and ammunition, did not pursue and the British ships were able to sink the 8,460 GRT ammunition supply ship Rohnfels which they encountered on their way out of the fjord. Soon, the German naval forces were blocked in by British reinforcements, including the cruiser HMS Penelope. During the night of 11-12 April, while manoeuvring in Narvik Harbour, Erich Koelner and Wolfgang Zenka ran aground. Wolfgang Zenka damaged her propellers and was restricted to a speed of 20 knots. Erich Koelner was much more badly damaged, so the Germans planned, when she was repaired enough to move, to moor her at Tarstad in the same capacity as Dietha von Rode, as an immobile defense battery. As the British destroyers left the Vestfjorden and outside Narvik, two German submarines, U 25 and U 51, fired torpedoes at them, but German torpedoes at the time had severe problems with their magnetic detonator systems, possibly due to the high northern latitude. All of them failed and either did not detonate at all or detonated well before their targets. Both the German naval commander, Commodore Friedrich Bonte and the British commander, Captain Bernard Warburton Lee were killed in the battle. Warburton Lee was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, Bonte the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Chapter 3, Second Naval Battle of Narvik The Royal Navy considered it imperative, for morale and strategic purposes, to defeat the Germans in Narvik, so Vice Admiral William Whitworth was sent with the battleship HMS Warspite and nine destroyers, four tribal class and five others, accompanied by aircraft from the aircraft carrier HMS Furious. These forces arrived in the Ofot Fjord on 13 April to find that the eight remaining German destroyers, now under the command of Fregattenkapitan Eric Bay, 
were virtually stranded due to lack of fuel and were short of ammunition. Before the battle, Warspite launched its catapult plane, which bombed and sank U-64, anchored in the Harjangsfjord near Bjerkvik. Most of the crew survived and were rescued by German mountain troops. This was the first U-boat to be sunk by an aircraft during the Second World War and the only instance where an aircraft launched from a battleship sank a U-boat. In the ensuing battle, three of the German destroyers were sunk by Warspite and her escorts and the other five were scuttled by their crews when they ran out of fuel and ammunition. First to go was Erich Koelna which tried to ambush the Allied forces but was spotted by Warspite's swordfish and subsequently torpedoed and shelled by the destroyers and battleship. The destroyer's commander, Alfred Schulze Hinrichs, and the surviving members of his crew, were captured by Norwegian forces. Then Wolfgang Zenker, Bernd von Arnim, Hans Ludemann and Hermann Kuhne engaged the British forces but only managed to lightly damage HMS Bedouin. British aircraft from Furious tried to engage the German destroyers but were unsuccessful, two were lost. Wolfgang Zenker tried to torpedo war spite. Finally, when the German destroyers were low on ammunition, they retreated, except for Hermann Kuhner, which had not received the order. Hermann Kuhner was fired upon by the pursuing HMS Eskimo, but she took no hits. Out of ammunition but undamaged, Hermann Kuhner was scuttled by her crew in Trollvika in the Harjangsfjord. After scuttling the ship, the crew placed demolition depth charges on the ship, attempting to sink her in Trollvika's shallow waters. Eskimo, still in hot pursuit, launched a torpedo which hit Hermann Kuhner, setting her on fire. Whether the German ship's own depth charges or the torpedo from Eskimo, was the source of the explosion is unclear. Eskimo was in turn ambushed by Georg Thiele and Hans Ludemann, losing her bow but surviving. Dieter von Rode and Erik Gieser, both suffering engine problems, fired upon the British forces while still docked, damaging Punjabi and Cossack but they were both sunk before they could cause further damage. That was the last German counter-attack. Shore batteries and installations were also very badly damaged by war spikes guns. On the Allied side, the damage to HMS Eskimo kept her in Norway until 31 May 1940. German submarines again suffered torpedo failures, when U-46 and U-48 fired at the departing war spite on 14 April. The remaining German destroyers retreated into Rombachsfjord, and were scuttled soon after. The only German ship which survived within the port area, was the submarine U-51. The Germans lost over 1,000 men, a U-boat, and eight destroyers. With the losses from the previous battle this constituted 50% of the Kriegsmariner's destroyer strength. It was reported by the Germans that shipwrecked Germans from Erich Gieser were fired upon by British artillery and machine guns during the engagement. About 2,600 survivors were organized into an improvised Marine infantry unit, the Gbergs Marine, and fought with the 139. Gberg Jaga Regiment in the subsequent land battle. Although unsuited for combat in the mountainous terrain around Narvik, the shipwrecked sailors manned the two 10.5 cm flak guns and the 11 light anti-aircraft guns salvaged from the ships, sunk during the naval battles and conducted defensive operations. The sailors were armed from the stocks captured at the Norwegian army base Elvgardsman, more than 8,000 Krog Jurgensen rifles and 315 machine guns intended for the mobilization of Norwegian army units in the Narvik area. Chapter 4 Later naval operations. After the naval battles of Narvik, the port and its surroundings remained in German hands, as no Allied forces were available to be landed there. Naval operations were limited at this stage to shore bombardment, as Narvik was not a primary Allied objective. Among others, the Polish destroyers Grom, Verza, and Bajskawika took part in these operations during which Grom was sunk by German aircraft on 4 May 1940, with the loss of 59 sailors. Chapter 5, Land Battle During the Norwegian campaign, Narvik and its surrounding area saw significant fighting, initially from 9 April between German and Norwegian forces, 
subsequently between Allied and German forces, conducted by the Norwegian 6th Division of the Norwegian Army as well as by an Allied Expeditionary Corps until 9 June 1940. Unlike the campaign in southern Norway, the Allied troops in Narvik would eventually outnumber the Norwegian troops. Five nations participated in the fighting. From 5 to 10 May, the fighting in the Narvik area was the only active theater of land war in the Second World War. At the outset, the position of the German commander, Dietl, was not good, his 2,000 troops were outnumbered. After the German destroyers had been sunk, however, about 2,600 German sailors joined in the land battle. Another 290 German specialists traveled via Sweden posing as health care workers. During the last three to four weeks, the Germans were also reinforced by about 1,000 men air-dropped over Bjornfjell, thus bringing the total number of Germans to around 5,600. Their position and outlook changed from good to dear several times. On occasions, the entire operation was controlled directly from the German high command in Berlin, Hitler's mood was reportedly swinging heavily and he repeatedly contemplated withdrawal. Intelligence agents captured later in the war also stated that Dietl himself had been considering crossing the Swedish frontier with his troops to be interned, until the German agent Marine Lee infiltrated Oinlech's headquarters at Trumsa, and obtained the British battle plan, however, the accuracy of this allegation has been questioned. The Norwegian force, under General Carl Gustav Fleischer, eventually reached 8,000 to 10,000 men after a few weeks. The total number of Allied troops in the campaign, in and around Narvik, reached 24,500 men. The early phase of the invasion was marked by the German advantage of surprise. Norwegian troops in northern Norway had been called out on a three month neutrality watch during the winter of 1939 1940, and so they had trained together. From 9 to 25 April, the Norwegian forces suffered three catastrophes. First, the forces protecting Narvik were unable to resist the Germans due to the commanding officer, the later NS herd commander Colonel Konrad Sundblow, refusing to fight the invaders, second, around 200 soldiers from the Narvik garrison, who had escaped capture and were blocking the railway to Sweden were caught by surprise while resting at Bjornfjell, most of the men being captured, third, IIR-12 sent to hold Gratangsbutten was attacked by surprise while in camp suffering casualties that ruined its spirit and effectively knocked it out of the remainder of the campaign. From Denmark, a battalion-sized detachment of the Luftwaffe's regiment General Goring, commanded by Hauptmann Kludge was sent by sea to Oslo, in April, being engaged alongside the army first in the advance to Trondheim, then north up into the Arctic Circle to take the port of Bodo and relieve the pressure on the beleaguered elite Gbergsjidja further north at Narvik. Due to mounting Norwegian pressure and difficulties with bringing up supplies to the forward-lying troops, the Germans abandoned Gratangsbutten and withdrew from the hill Laphaugen, and the valley Gratangsdalen, following the Battle of Gratangen. In the beginning of May, the Norwegians started an advance southwards towards Narvik. Once it became clear that the Allies would mount the main invasion of Narvik itself in mid-May, the Norwegian direction altered towards Bjornfjell. The British arrived first and set up headquarters in Harstad on 14 April. In the following days, three battalions were deployed mainly at Stjuvegen, Scanland and at Bogen. Later, they were deployed south of Offutfjord, at Ballengen and Herkvik. The initial British detachment, was reinforced on 28 April by a French expeditionary force, led by General Antoine Bithoart and composed of mountain troops. Three battalions of Alpine troops and two battalions of 13th Demi Brigade of the Foreign Legion were deployed both north and south of the Offutfjord, but later, the north would be the main French area of operation. Four Polish battalions arrived on 9 May. They were first deployed north of the Offutfjord, but later redeployed to the area south of the fjord. In early June they were formed into the Polish Pothale Independent Highland Brigade under General Zygmunt Bohus Sisko and Partovs. In addition, the Allies had difficulty in deciding how best to retake Narvik and the Iron Ore Railway. 
There was no unified command for the troops facing the Germans at Narvik, the Norwegians and the Allies retained separate commanders and cooperation between them was not always smooth. Even within the British forces, the Army and Navy commanders, Major General Pierce J. Mackesy and Admiral of the Fleet Lord Cork, had difficulty cooperating, Cork advocated a swift and direct attack from the sea while Mackesy advocated a cautious approach from both sides of the Offot Fjord. Consequent to this, on 21 April, Lord Cork was given supreme command of all Allied forces. In the second week of May, the Norwegian advances against the Germans east of Gratangzide were the most significant movements on the Narvik front. In addition, on the Norwegians' right flank French Alpine troops advanced up the Leiberg Valley, supported by a company of Norwegian ski troops. In the south, the Allies did not have much success, and in the north of the Ofotfjord, they were not making any progress. The Norwegians continued their successful mountain campaign, and in mid-May the Allies took the initiative, and achieved significant victories. Both Paris and London had been growing impatient with the slow progress in Narvik, and the French commander, Bithoart, had pressed for more action. The cautious approach on land was abandoned, and an amphibious attack was launched at around midnight on 12 May. This was directed at Björkvik and was preceded by a naval bombardment from British warships in Harjangsfjord. Then landing craft put ashore French foreign legionnaires, supported by five French Hotchkiss H-39 light tanks of the 342E CAC, which successfully attacked Björkvik, the Elfguardsmen army camp, and advanced northeast to where the Germans were withdrawing and south along the east side of Harjangsfjord. The plan also required Polish troops to advance toward Bjerkvik from land on the west side of the fjord, but heavy terrain delayed them, and they did not arrive before Bjerkvik was taken. It had also been part of the plan for French and Norwegian troops to advance from the north in order to box the Germans in, but cooperation problems between the Norwegian and French commanders left a gap through which the Germans escaped. Despite this, the Allies had a clear path north of Narvik and planned to attack over Rombaxfjord. It had been anticipated in London that as the build-up of troops in Narvik slowly continued, a corps headquarters would be needed to exercise effective control. On the 11th of May, Lieutenant General Claude Oinlec arrived in Narvik, and on the 13th of May assumed leadership of the Allied land and air forces, which at this time was designated the Northwestern Expeditionary Force. It was clear to the Allies that once Narvik was captured, its long-term retention would depend on permanently holding the town of Bodo to the south in Nordland which was on the route of the German advance from Trondheim. Consequently, Ohinlec redeployed all British troops to concentrate on this southern enterprise, and appointed French Brigadier General Bithoart, an expert in both mountain and winter warfare, to command the French and Polish troops which would be responsible for operations in the Narvik area in conjunction with Norwegian forces. Again, the attack was stalled while the Allies waited for air support to be fully established from Bardufoss. At 23.40 on 28 May, a naval bombardment commenced from the north. Two French and one Norwegian battalions would be transported across the Rombaxfjord and advance on Narvik from the north. In the south, the Polish battalions would advance toward Ankenes and Inner Base Fjord. The maximum capacity of the landing barges was 290 men, and these troops could not be reinforced for 45 minutes. These first troops were able to get a foothold on Orns by the time the rest of the French and the Norwegians were landed. The French moved west toward the city, and east along the railway. The Norwegians moved toward Taraldsvik Mountain, circled around and moved down toward the city. The German commander decided to evacuate before 7 o'clock and retired along Base Fjord. This was the first major Allied victory on land. Chapter 6, Operation Alphabet It seemed now that it was only a matter of time before the Germans would have to surrender. They were pushed from the north by the Norwegians, from the west by the French and from the southwest by the Poles. It appeared that Bjornfjell would be the Germans' last stand, but events elsewhere in Europe came to their rescue. 
London had already secretly decided to evacuate on the 24th of May and that became apparent in the following days. On the night of 24-25th of May, Lord Cork received orders to retreat, but under cover so the Germans would be prevented from interfering. The Allied commanders agreed that an attack on Narvik would disguise the retreat and allow the destruction of the Iron Ore Harbour. The Norwegian government and commanders were first told in early June and the news was met with disbelief and bitterness. The Norwegians still hoped to defeat the Germans alone and, as late as 5 June, one of the two Norwegian brigades was ordered to attack. The Norwegian government also explored the possibility of creating a neutral, but free northern Norway. This plan proved futile, and on 7 June the king and government were evacuated to Britain. All Allied troops were evacuated from Narvik between 4 and 8 June. Three Polish passenger ships, MS Sobieski, Batory, and Krobry, took part in the evacuation operation. Krobry was sunk on 14 to 15 May by German bombers. On 8 June, General Dietl retook Narvik, and on 10 June the last Norwegian forces in Norway surrendered. Chapter 7 Operation Juno on 7 June, the British aircraft carrier HMS Glorious had taken on board 10 Gloucester Gladiators and 8 Hawker Hurricanes from 46 Squadron and 263 Squadron Royal Air Force. These were flown off from land bases to keep them from being destroyed in the evacuation. Glorious left a larger convoy to proceed independently. The next day, while sailing through the Norwegian Sea to return to Scapa Flow, the carrier and her escorts, the destroyers HMS Acasta and Ardent, were intercepted by the German battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. The carrier and her escorts were sunk with the loss of more than 1,500 men. Scharnhorst was badly damaged by a torpedo from Acasta and both German vessels were hit by a number of medium shells. The damage to the German ships was sufficient to cause the Germans to retire to Trondheim, which allowed the safe passage of the evacuation convoy through the area later that day. Chapter 8 Aftermath The Allied offensive started slowly, unlike the Germans, they did not have a clear operational objective in Norway, and did not conduct their operations with as much vigour. The British had drafted plans to land in Narvik before the German invasion, troops and supplies had been loaded onto ships when they executed their mining operation on 8 April. These had been hastily unloaded when German ships were spotted northbound because the British thought that the German ships were trying to break into the Atlantic to avoid being trapped in German ports and wanted all their ships available to intercept the German fleet. The confusion dogged the troops for weeks, men and equipment were shipped to Norway separately without clear landing sites and orders were changed while en route. It was as if the Allies were confused by the many small and large fjords and bays and could not decide where it would be best to start, British, French and Polish units rapidly relieved each other which added to the lack of local knowledge. The cold and snow was a common enemy for all troops at Narvik, but most of the Allies were poorly prepared for it. The Norwegians were the only ones fully equipped with skis and able to use them. The British tried skis but their troops were largely untrained and supply was scarce. German sailors faced the same problems, even within the Gebirgsjiger and French mountain specialists, only a few units were equipped with skis and the Polish mountain brigade had no mountain training. Most troops were untested in battle. The Gebirgsjiger had participated in the invasion of Poland and some of the troops that had been airdropped over Bjornfjell had fought in the Netherlands. Some of the French foreign legionnaires came directly from fighting in North Africa, and most of the Polish officers and many of the soldiers had participated in the defense of Poland, some even in the Spanish Civil War and were highly motivated. The Allies had sea and air superiority until the very last stage of the operation, but did not take full advantage. The Germans lost the naval battle, but achieved the main goal of their operation, the successful Operation Wesiubung and occupation of Norway. Around Narvik, German naval losses were high, they lost ten destroyers, one submarine, and several support ships. In exchange, 
they sank one aircraft carrier, four Allied destroyers and damaged several others. The reason for this defeat lay in the German plans, which made it impossible for the destroyers to retire quickly, even if they had had adequate supplies. This was compounded by the design of German destroyers, despite their relatively large size and armament, they had inadequate fuel, and ammunition storage. The British forces achieved an indisputable local naval victory but were unprepared to follow it up with any land operation. This allowed the Germans to consolidate their foothold in Norway and made the subsequent Allied counter-invasion more difficult. Chapter 8 Section 1, Post-War In 1964, a war museum opened in Narvik, since 2016, the collections have been displayed in the Narvik War Museum, located inside the Narvik War and Peace Center. Parts of the bow of the German destroyer Georg, Thiele remain visible above the water in Rombachsbutten to this day. The wrecks at Narvik remain popular diving spots, although some are off-limits because they still contain undetonated ammunition. Three of the German destroyers were raised in 1964 and moved to Framnesodden, near Eitzvoid, to clear the shipping lane. The destroyers Anton Schwitt, Dieter von Roder, and Wilhelm Heidkamp rest in 12 meters of water there and were open for diving. A number of other wrecks are also accessible, but most have been preserved as historic sites and it is forbidden to dive to them. Chapter 9, Medals at least 1,200 French, British, and Polish participants in the battle were awarded the Norwegian War Cross for their contribution to the battle. Among the Norwegians who took part in the battle, only the top two military leaders were awarded the medal. Norwegian media has complained about this limited award. All German forces who partook in the battles of Narvik were awarded with the Narvik shield.